right. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, this is yet another one of KCS's three webinars, and we're very, very pleased to have Dr. Clara Minchel here with us. And uh, we are going to be looking, oh, just got a few more coming in here. We're very pleased to have Claire Mitchell to, ha uh, to host this webinar. And um, we are going to be uh, using the next hour to look at exercise and some of the mistakes that, uh, that, we, that we are commonly using when we're looking at uh, exercise and rehabilitation. Uh, the outline for today, just before I get go, just before I do a short uh, introduction for Claire, is that um, if you could keep yourself on mute during this, Claire uh, will will open up the floor to questions, and and uh, and then certainly please take yourselves off mute and and ask away. I'll also be monitoring the chat box, so if you are interested in submitting a question uh, via text, uh, no problem, and I will I will either uh, try to answer it or pass it on to Claire for. Uh, a more experienced answer, uh, depending on the question. Uh, <laughs> and good, looks like we're just about there. Thank you, everybody, for taking some time out of your life to attend today. Just going to do a short introduction for Claire. Claire is one of the most highly respected rehabilitation exercise specialists in the UK, and she has worked in the field of sports medicine and health for over 20 years as a senior lecturer, researcher, consultant, and also as a practitioner. Uh, she's designed and led major clinical and non-clinical research trials, several, uh, supervised several PhD students, and has published over 30 research papers in leading peer-reviewed sports medicine journals. She's also had some experience in both participating in high-level sports as a power lifter and has some personal experience with recovering from injury using exercise. And so with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Claire Munchell for today's, tonight's webinar. And she's joining us from the UK. So it's after midnight. So bear with her. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Go easy on me today. <laughs> I'm just after midnight here. So let's uh, try to do the first thing, which is share my screen and uh, see if we can get this up. So uh, are we looking good there, Rob? Looks good. Looks good. Super. Okay. Well, um, thank you everybody for for coming to this to this webinar. Key strength and conditioning principles missing from rehabilitation practice. So, um, if you're expecting something else, you're, you're in the wrong room. <laughs> so, uh, it's absolutely my my pleasure to be here, and thank you so much, Rob and um, the team at Keen Clinical Skills for for inviting me. It's uh, uh, as I said, a, a great pleasure to be able to deliver this to you guys. Um, there's quite a bit to get through. So um, just to kind of give a, a bit of an outline what I'd like to achieve in the next hour. Um, so muscle strength, what it is and how to train it optimally might seem quite simple. Hopefully it is. That's what I want to do, simplify everything. But oftentimes we can make some mistakes. We'll look at something called the principles of training, stroke rehabilitation. Uh, I really, you know, if you just take one thing away from today, it's that that can dramatically enhance the efficacy of any type of intervention, uh, whether it be training and or uh, rehabilitation. Uh, we're going to look at uh, periodization as a systematic way of approaching this difficult paradigm sometimes of what to focus on when with patients. Often there's a, a multitude of things that you, you might want to focus on when you, when you see individuals. So how can you make those decisions and determine the hierarchy of importance? Um, Look at exercise adaptation to maintain specificity. That will become clear uh, as we go through. And if we get time, I want to touch on rate of force development and muscle power. Now, before we get going, I just want to give you a little bit of, of background about me. Rob just gave uh, uh, a bio of somebody else. I don't know who that was. <laughs> it sounded quite good, though. Um, just know a little bit about the, my background. This is definitely not the Claire Minchel show, but just so you understand where I'm coming from in terms of the, the context of information that I'm delivering. So very quickly, I, I run a company called Get Back to Sports. It's not just about sport, it's about health, but we have the best research available from the sport performance literature that doesn't get translated well into rehabilitation, where I think it's even potentially more important, <clears throat> depending on who you're dealing with. So I run several courses, online courses, in-person courses. I also ha have a company called Joint Approach, which is fairly new founded, and we're working with the NHS 
over here in the UK, and we're um, just developing that to go international, which is applying some of the principles I'm going to be talking about today directly to patients. So this is an online program to manage knee osteoarthritis. Um, and uh, I, Maybe you're similar in Canada. We've got massive waiting lists, um, people having kind of spilled up from the pandemic, people suffering from <clears throat> uh, age related knee pain. So um, you can find out more about that with the website there if you wish. Uh, my collaborations and where I've worked from before, work, worked at before, uh, are numerous in terms of academic institutions and clinical institutions. Uh, my background is uh, initially academic. Um, so way back when I started my PhD, which was uh, 23 years ago now, um, I uh, was really blessed to be a part of a multidisciplinary team, which included orthopedic surgeons, physiotherapists, sports scientists, as I, as I was then, um, and a you know, professors in sports medicine. Um, and whilst I realized when I came out of that, that really wasn't the norm, it did give me that grounding and that information of and, and possibility what we can achieve when multiple disciplines work together um, and I developed um, a series of, of uh, techniques uh, to assess the, the neuromuscular system so I'm actually a neuromuscular physiologist um, but uh, that you know, kind of strength and conditioning is incorporated into that um, so I still, um, whilst I, I don't hold a, an academic course currently, I was an academic for over 10 years full time, I still am research active and um, very much enjoy uh, publishing and writing up data. Uh, I've applied what I've learned in terms of research that I've led and my research groups have, have led into um, my own sports performance so I, I've kind of done reasonably well uh, representing my country in several different sports and the reason for mentioning that is each one of those requires a different specificity of training which we will cover today but also from a, a practitioner perspective my passion really now lies with those older individuals because we can make huge huge impacts here by just doing simple things effectively but what really really excites me is being able to share this knowledge with you so I'm so blessed to um, travel the globe to you know talk to you guys individuals therapists um I, whilst i i like sharing my knowledge with the academic community where it's really going to make an impact is talking to people like you and if what i can tell you makes your job easier more effective then that's absolutely my pleasure and something that i really enjoy doing so that's it about me <laughs> i want to know about you um so why are you here what would you like to get out of um, from today? So I'm going to hopefully launch a poll in a second so I can just get a measure of who's in the room. As I said, I've been really blessed to um, talk to thousands of, of practitioners globally, therapists and rehabilitation um, professionals. And there's a few common themes that kind of come up when people attend courses or webinars about strength and conditioning. Now, see if any of these resonate with you. So number one, perhaps, you know there's more to rehabilitation than three sets of 10. And that strength and conditioning could hold the key to unlocking something better. So maybe that kind of resonates with you. Reason two, you have a passion personally for strength and conditioning. I certainly have. You love lifting, but perhaps you're struggling to bridge that gap between strength and conditioning and rehabilitation. So is that you? Number three. You're stressed out, you're overworked, you have to manage patients on the fly. And I know that's probably resonates with, with most people here. And But you're looking for that something that will save you time and improve patient outcomes. Maybe you think that's you and strength and conditioning could perhaps help there. Or is it number four? You're intrigued about strength and conditioning and what it can do to accelerate your practice and your patient outcomes. So you don't really know much about it, but maybe it has a relevance and you'd like to know. So I am going to... Let's go to that there. So which one? I mean, if I launch that poll, poll, hopefully, then you can start to select your answer. Is it one? To, oh, it's working. <laughs> that's that's wonderful. So I'll just give that another another few seconds. As you can see, the bar's going up and down here. So who who are you? What would you like to get out of today? Okay, last five seconds. Any more for any more? Three, 
two, one, end poll. Now I'm going to share results, hopefully, and uh, Matt, the technical whiz, will come in and uh, tidy up if it doesn't work. If I share the results, hopefully you can see that. <laughs> Um, that says to me, so the majority of people are, you can't see it, um, majority of you, 68% say number one, you know there's more to rehab than three sets of 10, strength and conditioning could, could um, hold the key to unlocking something better. So that's the majority of people with a few people un unsure about what SNC can do, and, uh, but you're interested in and how it might accelerate patient outcomes. That's great, thanks so much for doing that. I'm just gonna close that down now. Let's get into it. So let's set a framework for today. There's a lot that we can talk about. Um, and I just want to give some sort of context. Now, if we think about rehabilitation um, and conditioning and injury avoidance, we've got this kind of complex interaction between kind of broadly speaking here, the, the passive components of a joint. So if we're thinking about dynamic joint stability and the active components. Now, the passive components being principally, you know, the osseous geometry, tendons, ligaments, uh, cartilage. And, and yes, it's, it's not truly passive. Obviously, they, they have sensory tissue. But in terms of its responsiveness, it's a lot more latent by comparison to the dynamic component of that joint. And I know you know this, but we're just kind of setting the scene here. Everybody's on the same page, which is the musculature. So as we're kind of doing things and placing demands on the, the, the body, then the role of this active component has to be you know, kind of pretty good in terms of performance. And the role is enhanced. The more dynamic we become, the more stress strain we place on the body. So how do we start to evaluate whether or not it's performing well or indeed if there's deficiencies? Well, we can start to look at the neuromuscular function or the performance. Something that we measure a lot in research and indeed you might measure that in clinic is strength. So we're going to focus on that today principally, but also it's not just about strength. It's about rapidity of muscle force production. How quickly can we generate force? And even before that, how quickly can the musculature switch on? And there's a period of time where we know we need to be kind of contracting the musculature, but there's a series of physiologic processes that need to happen before we can generate that response. And then clearly this needs to be, you know, controlled. So the response needs to be perfect for every condition, right? Or perhaps then that increases the risk of injury also. So what I want to first focus on is muscular strength. Why? It's so important, and hopefully um, I'm going to make a case for that today. It's so important. We cannot afford to overlook it or assume that it will improve with inverted commas, run-of-the-mill type exercises. So many people, unfortunately, make mistakes in designing exercises to build it. And I don't know if it's the same in Canada um, as it is in the UK, um, but as I said, I teach uh, in, in multiple countries. It, it does seem to be that when we approach resistance training for rehabilitation, we often are encouraged to think about endurance, muscular endurance first. And certainly when I'm teaching on even master's level uh, MSCs in, in physiotherapy, that still predominates. And then we've got maybe start to think about, well, we can see a cross-sectional area difference between injured and non-injured limbs. So maybe then we need to think about hypertrophy. Then maybe we can load up and do strength and possibly even think about power. But in doing so, you know, we we kind of forget about exercise adaptation. Strength is deprioritized. And while we reduce the load, we lose the specificity of exercise and the efficacy of exercise. And I'm going to come on to that, what that is very shortly. What I'd like you to consider is this strength first approach. And I'm a massive advocate for strength first. So consider strength first and foremost in the rehabilitation process when clinically you know the, the tissue is, is right to receive that stimulus and then all manner of prescriptions become valid if you individualize based on needs and goals of the patient so you've got strength then power or hypertrophy whatever or indeed just strength it doesn't have to be a multitude of things you might not have the resources and time to go beyond that but at least we're thinking about what's I view is one of the most important parameters of neuromuscular function. Now, why is it important? I'm going to go through a series of studies here, not in great depth, 
you'll probably be relieved to know, but it represents a body of research in itself. So is muscular strength associated with injury risk? Well, if we look at the team sports literature, and again, I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, this literature, but just to kind of provide this framework, we have uh, the series of papers by Lawson et al. and others, which show that in team sports, strength training potentially can reduce the risk of sports injuries. Uh, and that's, remember, in team sports. So this particular study um, was a review of six well-controlled studies with just under uh, or just over seven and a half uh, thousand participants that showed that on balance, the meta-analyses of that data showed that strength training programs reduce sports injuries by an average 10 uh, 66 percent, sorry, so there's that dose response as well. So 10% increase in strength training volume reduced the risk of injury by about four percentage points. And I can see the forest plot here. Uh, and I said, there's, there's, there's other literature in this arena too, which, which say a very similar thing. Now, if we look at running, we've got the question mark against running. Um, this paper came out a, a few years ago, um, which showed that running uh, the New York, Mar or, or should we say strength training prior to running the, the New York Marathon did not have an effect on incidence of injury. So 720 runners were recruited and they randomly allocated them to a strength training group and a, just a normal training group. So no additional training. And the incidence of injury at the end of the marathon was no different between groups. Now, we're going to look at this study in a, in a short while because the devil's in the detail. And you will know by the end of this webinar that this intervention, if you read beyond the abstract, you will see that wasn't a strength training intervention at all. And I was surprised, actually, that that got published. Um, so we think there's uh, and I think, you know, as the research becomes better, particularly in this arena, I think we'll start to see a different picture in, in terms of running. Okay, let's pivot a little bit and think about other things in sport. Muscle pain is associated with quality of life and pain. So again, there's a body of data and research that shows that muscle strength or indeed muscle weakness is associated with knee osteoarthritic joint pain. So this study by Muraki, and as I said, there are many others, shows that muscle strength and indeed when we take into account body mass, that is associated with knee pain. So there was no association with grip strength, which is a proxy marker sometimes that we use for, for uh, overall body strength or indeed muscle mass. So strength is really important in mitigating or reducing the experience of osteoarthritic knee pain. Now, not only is it kind of important in potentially alleviating symptoms or preventing symptoms we've got this relationship between muscle weakness and becoming dependent on others in, in later life for activities of daily living so this great systematic review here by Wang again just a few years ago 83 articles just under 110,000 participants showed that muscle measures taken at baseline were predictive, so this is kind of pr perspective uh, design, were predictive of becoming dependent on others in later life for just normal daily activities. And it's not just quality of life, it's quantity of life. Again, there's a you know massive or merging body of, of literature and research, research that's showing that muscle strength is associated with all-cause mortality. So that's not, for example, um, a, as a result of a fall, it's from any cause. So a uh, prospective study by Lee, excellent study here. Low muscle strength was independently associated with elevated risk of all-cause mortality, regardless of muscle mass. And they took into account all other confounders, confounders as well. And when they looked at kind of the subgrouping and looking at muscle mass and, and muscle strength, individuals in the subgroup with low muscle mass had a significant increased risk for all-cause mortality only when they had low muscle strength. So it's muscle, muscle strength that's the key indicator. And I did a series of posts on my website. So my website is getbacktosport.com. There's a, um, a strength and conditioning blog there that distills important information to kind of research, uh, sorry, um, rehabilitative practice. A little infographic I just produced on that that shows, again, the body of research that's there, the importance of muscle strength, and even just doing some amount of resistance training, just some amount versus none, 
can reduce this increased risk of death um, by, you know, kind of 10 to, to 20 percent. So strength is pretty important. Forgive me for, for, for going so quickly through this, this data, because I want to get to things that you can take away and use. So I, I think it's pretty important. This has convinced me, this body of literature, but not just only is it important for that. Strength is a foundation upon which a multitude of other abilities and, and elements of function are built and enhanced. Now, I just kind of layer on some of those things here. And let's take an example of uh, an older individual kind of standing up out of the chair, stepping forward and, you know, tripping over the tortoise or whatever it is, a carpet in front of them. What is it that's going to prevent them from falling or indeed uh, right posture or mitigate the, the, the consequences of that trip? Now, you could argue, and, and you know, you wouldn't be wrong here, that, that muscle power might be the most important thing here because that person has to accelerate that lower limb segment quickly to kind of you know, um, put the foot on the floor overcome the you know the effects of gravity on their body mass and right posture and that's correct however if that individual is weak to start with and they don't have enough force whatever enough is in you know kind of uh, strength as it were then it's a kind of it's, it's a moot point really to consider training for this power type performance if they don't have enough fuel in the tank to to supply that. And, and that's where I think thinking about strength as a fuel tank is really, really useful. And patients, to be honest, really get on board with this. Now think about um, a car running on empty. Okay. So that's definitely my car right now, given fuel prices in the UK. I don't know about yours in Canada, but if you if fuel tank's empty, you're not going to go very far and you're not going to go very fast. Now use that analogy with, with muscular strength. If there's very little force capacity in the tank, that individual is not going to go very fast, not going to go very fast. Versus topping up that fuel tank, they now have a lot more capacity, a lot more force, a lot more strength to be able to play with. So their ability to contract the musculature um, becomes much more forceful. Thus, as well, you think about kind of training other elements of performance. If they're very, very low in, in force and you train power, then they're only going to be expressing a small amount of muscular force versus if they've got a lot more force to play with, then those interventions that seek to improve muscle force production quickly are going to be more effective. And also, it means that things like muscular endurance also improves by increasing strength and I know that might sound a little bit weird but if you think about again that older individual getting up out of a chair if they're exceptionally weak that could represent a maximal strength effort now if they become much stronger clearly they're going to be able to complete that task a multitude of times and this is one of the reasons why which we won't talk about today but why strength training improves running economy and time trial performance because every effort becomes that little bit less maximal or more sub-maximal. <clears throat> so strength is, is super important for all manner of things to potentially mitigate injury, to you know, improve longevity, quality of life, quantity of life, and um, also to maximize the enhancement of other parameters and other elements of performance. So how do we rehabilitate it? That must be a really simple thing to do, right? Okay, here's an, another poll for you. Which of these variables is most important to optimizing muscle strength development? So we've got speed of contraction, and I'm saying fast contraction here, time under tension, is it resistance or load, or is it something else other? So if I go to pull and go that one, and I click that, hopefully you can see that on your screen. What I'd like to know is what's most important in developing muscular strength. Speed, fast speed of contraction, time under tension, resistance or load, or something else. Oh, okay. <laughs> 
it's swapping, it's swapping. Last couple of seconds then. Okay, we'll give it 30. Five seconds to go. And we'll stop there. So what did we find? Hopefully, again, if I share results with you, you'll be able to see that. So we've got 60% uh, of people say it's the resistance or load. Nobody said speed of muscular contraction. Time under tension is the second highest. And then other. That'd be interesting to see what the, the others um, would say. So what is it? Let me close that down. What is it? Well, they're all pretty important. But those individuals that said resistance or load, you're spot on. Because time and time again, this comes out as the most influential factor of improving muscular strength. And again, this might seem quite silly, but look at this, right? How do we do, how do we rehabilitate strength? Do we take some exercise, add some resistance and do three sets of 10? Unfortunately, I still see these prescriptions. And I say, unfortunately, because this is not a muscle strength, ex strengthening exercise. Why? Well, think about what's being given here. So you've got three sets of 10. Why do we stop at 10? What is what is what does 10 mean and why is it three sets of 10? OK, let's forget that for a minute. You get an exercise band or a resistance band, which is great. Fantastic. But think about that prescription. And it is given to all these different people. And in time pressured environments, I absolutely get why you might do this and or not you. But my why it might be done. You know, you need to get some exercise done with some resistance. But we can do a lot, lot better than this with just a little bit of extra thought. So this person here is likely to have a different baseline capacity to this person than to this person. So therefore, that stimulus, and we can improve that stimulus, is likely to present a different challenge or indeed potentially no challenge at all. So why? Well, let's just think about what muscular strength is. And we don't have time really to go into the physiologic determinants. Um, but we'll just touch on the definition. When I teach my courses, um, I ask people what the definition of muscular strength is. And invariably, I don't get the same answers from every individual. Um, I get a variation on a theme. The importance of that is if we're all doing something slightly different or working towards a slightly different definition, then we will be doing slightly different interventions. Now, muscular strength is, or to be really pedantic, maximal muscular strength, is the maximal contractile force a muscle or muscle group can produce in a single contraction. Now, just think for a moment, the intensity of effort required to build this. Is it going to be optimized by doing three sets of 10 with a resistance band and you could keep going? Or do we require a slightly different approach to optimize that, that input, that and that's what I want to try and achieve, really, is that maximization of, of that input output equation for the effort you're putting in, for the effort the patient's putting in, the returns that's generated. And I often show this repetitions maximum <clears throat> continuum, which if you've not seen this before, it's a little bit of a, a, a busy um, graphic. But along the top and bottom, you see these numbers these numbers represent the number of repetitions you can perform to failure safely and with um, proper form. And the size of text indicates the size of response. Now, ignore the colours because it's slightly confusing. And to say there is some debate, and quite um, rightly so, in the literature about, you know, particularly the hypertrophy column and where that might occur, uh, possibly a little bit on the power as well. But we're just focusing on strength right now. If you look at the size of stimulus, oh, sorry, the size of uh, text here, we see that the greatest improvement in muscular strength is seen at these very low repetition ranges. But that represents a very high level of effort. So I don't know how many of you who are listening have ever tried to perform a five repetition maximum. So that's lifting something you cannot lift six times. There's just no ability to do because that that's you've reached your your effort your maximal effort on that particular exercise and that's a real challenge and it's very very different to what we do in daily life and it's often very different to what we do certainly in fitness prescriptions so when we think about those three sets of 10 or 12 
And assuming that people are going to failure, it's not really doing all that much effectively. Certainly, we're not effective, being as effective as we can on strength development, no power, no hypertrophy. An actual fact, 12 repetitions maximum represents a muscular endurance, a high intensity muscular endurance intervention. Now, as I said, there is some debate over this, and rightly so. Hypertrophy, for example, you can get a cross-sectional area change at this lower intensity, at an 8 to 12, across the whole of this almost. It's about volume. But again, we don't have the time to go into the intricacies of that. But what I want to illustrate is that if we're not really considering those exercise prescriptions properly, you're going to have wasted time and effort of of everybody effectively. So you do something new, you will get some development. Don't get me wrong. So you start out, that person's never done any type of resistance exercise before. You give them a TheraBand or a resistance band, they go away and do three sets of 10. And maybe there are some still left in the tank. They will develop. They'll get a little bit stronger. They'll probably get a little bit quicker. They might improve you know, other things as well, but that will quickly plateau. And from then on, we need to be specific on what we're doing. Else, you know, we resist a plateauing and then people disengage because they're they're bored versus you know this continued improvement and where does this come from well i absolutely kind of get it as well in that if we look at you know the runner's world uh for example a running magazine with an online presence that's internationally known strength building for runners this is a program here that shows that we need to do 10 to 12 repetitions for the hamstrings, but yet six to eight to the quadriceps. Why that prescription is different, I don't know. Very little information on intensity. Calf raises, however, to get stronger, need 20 repetitions. So confusing. Yet also we see this type of exercise with a, a band and a bridge. And also we see this type of exercise, a 10 essential strength training exercise for runners. 45 to 60 seconds of a plank. That's not a strength training exercise. Think about the energy systems required to fuel that contraction. It's the ATP PC system. That will last a maximum eight to 10 seconds at, at best. So if we're thinking five repetitions maximum, we're going for 60 seconds. That is not muscular strength. And certainly the intensity is nowhere near enough. And even when we look at running related research, so when I showed you that study before that showed no influence of strength training on running in injury incidents, this is it. And we've just had one published this month, just this January. Again, disappointingly showing, describing the interventions as strength training, but we've got 10 reps with no indication of intensity. So you can be doing 10 reps to failure, or you can be doing 10 reps with 10 left in the tank. They're going to do very different things. And actually, if we brought that down to five to failure, it'd be far, far better in terms of effectiveness. We've even got a 30 second time period here. Likewise for these Again, a very similar prescription. We've not got a strength training prescription. So again, it's no, for me, no surprise that we don't see any effect because we're not really doing what we, we say we're doing. So how to focus rehabilitation. So when you see a person, a patient, and I didn't mean to, <laughs> to draw on that then, how big is your list? You, you probably sat there going, well, that's, that's, that's fine. But when I see somebody, I've got to do this, I've got to consider this. And, the, you know, you've got a long, a lot of things to consider. Or where do you put all of these things in your rehabilitation? And I think probably as well, an important or maybe just as important question um, to consider alongside is how much time do you have and what resources do you have? So I want to just illustrate something that is really helpful in determining your exercise interventions and that's the principles of training and indeed these apply to, to anything that you're doing that's new and that's specificity overload and progression again really simple but very effective you take a moment to think consider what you really want to do and it will help formulate this formula will help formulate the best exercise intervention or rehabilitation intervention. We'll come to patient considerations in a second. So the specificity of the training intervention will elicit specific outcomes. So the specificity is what do you want to achieve specifically? We don't have a magic single exercise that will do everything. 
the overload, what is the intensity at which you need to prescribe? What's the stimulus you need to cause adaptation? Got those two things right, your patient will progress, but we need to take account of that in exercise prescription, else they will plateau. As I said, you, we don't have this magic approach where we can optimize adaptation across a multitude of different parameters. So we need to be very specific. And that's good because we can run the risk of overwhelming the patient. So imagine actually if you did do multiple things and you did do an exercise prescription for them and you gave them an exercise sheet with 30 things on, they will not do any. But also if they did, you run the risk of overwhelming the neuromuscular system. So for example, concurrently training strength and uh, cardiovascular endurance can have this interference effect where again, this overwhelm um, seeks to interfere with those adaptations and compromises them. So do you think about the specific things when you see an individual, what you want to achieve? The overload, right? So we, we, we're doing strength in this example. We want to high loading, low repetitions, but also when to think about number of times, how often and, and the rest, because that's critically important too. And then progression. How do you give individuals that progression so they can keep going? And that's where that repetition maximum continuum comes in as really useful. If you don't see individuals regularly, if you don't see them um, for a number of weeks and you give them an exercise prescription and it's X number of kilos, for example, they're likely to adapt. They're likely then to become easier. So either they'll come back and be doing the same number of reps that you've told them to do, and they probably can do another 30, or they'll come back and tell you, now I can do 30 of these repetitions. In which case, in both instances, you've lost that specificity. But by giving somebody a repetitions maximum, I want you to pick a resistance that you can only do five times. When you can do consistently seven repetitions across a couple of sets, no matter what the exercise is, I'd like you to increase the weight, increase the intensity, increase the resistance. So they can come... Uh, continue to progress in your absence. So I said, and, and for me, forgive me again, I'm kind of flying through these things. Uh, I said that we would look at making these decisions about what to focus on when you've got so many things potentially to, to think about. How do you make that decision? What's this hierarchy of importance? Now, I wrote this chapter for Elsevier's Sports Physiology and Injury Management um, textbook, although it says it's performance related. I wrote this with an intention to apply to any population. So at the top here, what we've got is this acute phase. So as I said before, clinically, you want to make sure that it's appropriate to load the tissue. Um, so clearly, you wouldn't intervene with a strength training program and acutely um, kind of grade three hamstring tear, for example. So you've got all your kind of clinical concerns met. They're into their rehabilitation. These are some of the things we might want to consider. Strength, potentially rate of force development, proprioceptive abilities, and then maybe performance-related proprioceptive abilities. And the size of arrow indicates the size of focus for each phase. Now, if we split up a rehabilitation program into early through to late phase, which would be discharge, return to sport, activities, whatever. The length of that's clearly going to uh, change based on what it is that that person has undergone in terms of you know, operation or um, injury. But you'll notice that in that early phase here, the um, first focus is on muscular strength. So we want to build that foundation. And also we want to improve sensory motor abilities, so the proprioceptive uh, ability too. I'm not focusing on speed of muscle force production, nor am I relating this to performance or activities of daily living, um, maybe it'd be a, a falls avoidance program. At this moment in time, I need to do a few things and very well, and I need to build a foundation. Then latterly, if you've got the time, resources and, and luxury, you can then periodize. So this is, a, as I said, a periodization program, but used to determine what to focus on when this hierarchy of importance within rehabilitation so we've now built the strength we can learn how to express it quickly and indeed maybe even relate that to if you work with athletes sport performance or indeed if you're working with other populations then normal activities of daily living or as i said falls avoidance now coming back to that question or that 
point how much time do you have and what resources you have. Um, this situation where maybe you've got very low performance, inverted commas, performance demands, and perhaps your time is limited. So a knee OA program, for example, might take 12 weeks in duration. And whilst it might have deficits across a multiple uh, spectrum of, of indices of performance, you've got limited time to make big differences and impact across a multitude of things. So I argue that I'm yet to see a very strong individual come to see me with um, uh, knee osteoarthritis. So let's do one thing and do it really well. That means that my progression actually is just a big fat strength arrow. And indeed, this is what we do in the joint approach program. People are working to five repetitions maximum as they um, get um, more confident and comfortable with doing resistance exercise. So I'm topping up that fuel tank. They're becoming stronger. And indeed, the pain is reducing and their ability to, to walk for longer distances. Um, and because we also have shared determinants between um, strength and rate of force development or, or power, if you want to measure it globally, then we will get some adaptation in speed of muscle force production as well, just a little bit. So we're thinking about here, what we're trying to do to improve muscular strength, we want recruitment of fast twitch motor units. We want the, them to synchronously fire together. We want to reduce inhibition. We want um, all of this initially anyway, within this, this um, first 12 weeks, the, the neural parameters to improve, the drive into the musculature to improve. and these things are also important in some elements of rate of force development. Now, I might have come across of um, being derogatory about banded exercise. I'm not at all derog uh, being derogatory about that. I'm just saying, consider the exercise challenge that it presents. This is uh, a video from the Joint Approach Programme. This individual here has... Um, the two, is, two um, heaviest resistance bands overlapped and we're doing a five second near maximal isometric contraction or held at end range. Now look, on his, <laughs> we've got all of the resistance bands wrapped around his, uh, his legs as he's doing um, uh, some hip abduction work. Now he's trying to style it out, but if you look at his face, he's really putting in the effort and that's what we want to achieve that real intensity of effort, that's going to cause those adaptations to muscular strength. Right, you work with patients, you've got clinical considerations, they've got range of motion limitations, they've got pain, they're older, I get that, right? So you're working with the most difficult population and typically what happens is we have this fear of loading. So as soon as we see a patient um, or an older person, we immediately think deload, deload, take the weight away, reduce the resistance, particularly if something's causing a little bit of discomfort, even though clinically you think it's okay, you know, they're a bit uncomfortable. Okay, just deload it, get rid. And what we do here is reduce the specificity, compromise the effectiveness of that exercise. And what I'd like you to think about is to first and foremost, consider just before you touch load, what else is it that you can do to change the parameters of that exercise? We can adapt the exercise efficaciously to bring about adaptations that we want. So if we're talking strength here, high load, low repetitions, we can adapt the exercise. And that's what we're going to focus on in this bit. So I encourage you to almost like kind of nail the load to, 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 the, to the floor. That's the thing that we're going to consider last in terms of changing. So we've determined that individual needs to get stronger. How are they going to get stronger? High load, low repetitions. However, they've got, let's take that OA knee. Yeah, it hurts as we do a knee extension, full range of motion with a heavy resistance band. But there's just a few strategies here. And there are a multitude of others that I teach as well that you can use to change the parameters of that exercise. Nobody says it has to be a full concentric, eccentric, full range uh, muscular effort. We can use isometric activation. High level muscle isometric mu muscle activation brings about um, muscular strength adaptations at that particular joint angle. And indeed, if you come back to long muscle lengths, it actually conveys a strength adaptation across a multitude of joint positions as well. 
closed kinetic chain might be provocative for an osteoarthritic knee. Can we do open kinetic chain? Range of movement. So even in dynamic exercises, limited range, high intensity muscular efforts show improvements in muscular strength. And again, if we manage to do that at longer muscle lengths, again, conveys benefit across range. And we can use a combination of these strategies as well. So remember, that, as I said, everything's evidence-based. There's a strong evidence base for this too. Everything's relative to that individual. So lifting heavy, what I can lift is going to be lift different to what you can lift to what other people can lift. And that's, again, why that repetitions maximum is really useful. So some of these uh, adaptations, the bottom here, we've got limited range, single leg knee extensions. OK, dead easy. We can do eccentric work. So there's a real unique neuro neuromuscular strategy for activation during eccentric activations, preferential recruitment of fast twitch motor units, lift with two lower with one we can accommodate more load than we can produce concentrically isometric you know here's me just at the top there loaded up the leg press i can no way i can move that but i'm producing a maximal contraction at a particular joint angle through then to you know full compound um kind of squats with barbell if your individuals are uh, you've got the resources and they're capable of doing that so everything's relevant and including you know your banded exercise too and as I said, I, I teach a multitude of these strategies and a lot more depth of what we just talked about on online courses and, and in person. I just wanted to touch a little bit on the other thing that I mentioned, which is rapidity of force generation. So I hope it's coming across that um, this is important for all populations. It goes without saying for athletes, um, but it also hopefully is resonating in terms of non-athletic populations. So what about muscle power, rate of force development, the ability to produce quickly, force quickly? And, and indeed, I'm just enrolling this course right now, which talks about that very thing. Why do we focus on power when I made such a, a big case for strength? So strength is fundamentally important. But just think about how quickly, for example, injuries happen. And this is where it's quite confusing when you look at the academic literature. Rate of force development, the ability to produce muscle force quickly is also called explosive strength. But you will see why in a minute. How do we measure this stuff? Well, this is a, a lab setup, uh, an old lab setup of, of mine, a former PhD student sat there. What we're doing is going to accept, assess the knee extensors. You can see some electrodes here. So we've got electrical activity. We've got the um, um, load cell here. It's an isometric setup. Uh, a dynamometer custom built to look horrific uh, it's actually built so we've got very very limited no extraneous movement so highly accurate I shout go at him he kicks up produces force holds it until I say relax so I just zoom out a little bit and see what else we can glean from this so this is a, a lab-based setup um, there are some now handheld dynamometers that might uh, produce the same kind of quality of assessment if you pay attention to the the setup uh, and that's another discussion topic. But from this, we can see we've got the strength of the peak force, the maximal contractile capability of the musculature. We've also got, if you see at the bottom here, this is the electrical activity. Looks like it starts at the same time as the muscular force, but actually it doesn't. If I put two cursors on that, we can see there's a delay. This delay time increases substantively with fatigue with muscle damage with other factors as well so it's a really really important um, parameter which we don't have time to to get right into but I'll show you the, the importance of it shortly and then we've got the gradient this is the rate of force development how quickly can you muster levels of force and this is a um, here this line represents half peak force we might produce about half peak force when we're running so that's tends to be one of the reasons why it's reported in the literature as a, a, a time force parameter. Now, it's really difficult to illustrate, um, I guess, the, the things that need to happen to stabilize a joint before it becomes injured and at the point of injury. I've tried to do it nevertheless. I put, um, so this is this is from my, my thesis actually. At that time, um, the best evidence we had about injury incidents, non-contact injury incidents, was the ACL from um, downhill skiing from video evidence. And that estimated around about 300 milliseconds was the time frame for, from healthy ligament through to, to rupture. 
So that's a third of a second, about the time it takes to blink an eye. Now let's take the worst case scenario of things that we need to respond to. So if we take a, a visual stimulus or auditory stimulus, which is not always the case, I get it, but let's just layer on these things. We've got the information processing of that um, the information coming in through the eyes or ears, selection of the right motor program, then sending of that signal through the central nervous system, through the periphery into the muscle site. Now that pre-motor time doesn't really change all that much. It's what happens when we get to the musculature. So then first we've got to switch the musculature on, which is that switch on time I talked about, then produce some meaningful levels of force. So let's say it's half peak force. If we add all of that up in a conditioned athlete, we've got a very, very small margin for error. So maybe about 100 milliseconds if we're lucky. Now, what happens if we get fatigued? What happens if we're older? So older populations, deconditioned populations, rehabilitating populations, these figures change a lot. And it's some of these deficits potentially that we're left with when we're discharging patients or they haven't rehabilitated fully. Some of these things as well are not um, back to where they should be. So that switch on time of the musculature increases. So does the rate at which force is produced. So if you're thinking about an injury avoidance model, then our margin for error is even smaller. Now, as I said, it's very difficult to illustrate this realistically. And if you look at ultra high speed filming now, the estimate is around about 50 milliseconds from point of foot contact in handball uh, to ACL injury. Uh, and as I said, there's other things that go on along with this in terms of anticipatory responses. But nevertheless, these physiologic processes do need to happen. So when we're thinking about muscle power, rate of force development, uh, speed of force production, we often think about performance. And clearly, muscle power is associated with things like jumping. There's a really discrete task there, or maybe even sprinting, whether it be on the ground or in the pool. We're starting to think it's probably important rate of force development, muscle activation times and injury avoidance. But what about kind of activities of daily living and foil, falls avoidance? So it is a performance based task because everything involves an element of performance. Even descending stairs is requiring an element of performance from the musculature. It's just the absolute levels are slightly different. And I invite you to consider in this scenario here that we're also accommodating force as well as producing force. So take that older adult and stepping down, there's a need to quickly accommodate eccentrically force apply, placed onto uh, you know, the specific joints and in the specific musculature. And this is important for things like falls avoidance. <clears throat> if we look at the parameters of, of an osteoarthritic knee and how that compares to you know, let's say mild knee OA compared to uh, severe knee OA and just how these things shape up, we can clearly see, and this is a great paper just published last year, um, the peak force, the strength of the musculature <clears throat> on this side here, mild knee OA compared to severe knee OA, we've got a, a much reduced strength capacity. As I said, that's really something we need to focus, focus on. And the strength occurs later in that time frame. If we look at the rate of force development, so the, the slope of this curve here, the force time curve, and then what happens in severe neo A, it's, there's a reduced rate of force produ production. It, force is being produced much more slowly. And if we think about an absolute level of force, just arbitrarily, let's take 150 newtons, then that equates to almost 200 milliseconds time difference. So that clearly illustrates the importance, again, of some of these deficits. And we can talk about how we, we can get there in terms of training. And I'm conscious I'm kind of running out of time here, but we can discuss this in questions later. But we can progressively get there through um, using um, non, I guess, sport-specific type um, interventions. To highlight the importance in, in sporting populations, we've now got this great body of research of ACL populations that we know there's an interlim asymmetry in strength performance. We're seeing it now in rate of force development. And, you know, that's not surprising. And that prevalence of reduction in ACL, uh, sorry, in rate of force development, um, I suppose, proper rehabilitation or these interlim asymmetries might be even greater in terms of its extent of, of asymmetry by comparison to, to the peak force or strength. And it may stay for many, many years thereafter. 
And indeed, this is just some of our data that we've got on, on ACLs um, and rate of force development. We don't really have time to, to kind of go into that. But again, just highlighting things like specificity. Do you want to improve speed and muscle force production? We need to understand those things that drive speed and muscle force production. And we've got the neural determinants and we've got muscular determinants. Think about your machinery or the machinery. We've got the contractile capacity. We've got the input into the contractile machinery. And we've got these things here that transmit muscle force to bone. So there's a lot of things that we need to think about how we can improve the parameters and the performance characteristics of these things. And this is just a schematic of how the contractile um, and the musculoskeletal is, uh, system is schematically illustrated in um, academic papers. We've got the contractile component. We've got this tendon, tendon aponeurosis, which has, acts as a kind of elastic thing. We need to improve the parameters of that, get a stiffer tendon. We need to get more fast twitch motor unit recruitment, in, increase the drive into the musculature. We need to increase fast twitch motor unit, the synchrony of firing. Then laterally, we can start to see more morphological changes. We can increase a cross-sectional area and the size of that machinery. Um, we can increase tendon stiffness. And these different types of things influence different parameters. And indeed, I won't come onto this now because I haven't got time. Um, just coming to the end. but. Even rate of force development is determined by different parameters. So we've got the early phase and we've got late phase um, in terms of the determinants of rate of force development. So to illustrate, specificity is absolutely key. It's a very, very, very simple concept, but it underlies their most effective rehabilitation and conditioning programs. OK, so this is kind of a, a whistle stop tour here, but just to kind of summarize what we've what we've covered, the principles of training really important. It helps you avoid that shotgun approach, just taking a moment to think about and plan what you're trying to do to improve its effectiveness. Strength fo first uh, focus. I can't you know, my my view, my humble opinion, this is where we should be headed first and foremost, even if it's to, to discount it actually that person's strong enough, fine, let's move on to something else like expression of, of that. And using these kind of schematics can help with that. The determination of order importance of, of different things can be really made easier by using this adapted periodization model. So, you know, thinking about what it is you want to focus on that strength first approach and putting other things in that uh, list to determine the hierarchy of importance. And you know, the time frame you've got with individuals will determine how much of that can get done. And of course, will the individual's needs and goals. And then specificity as well. So if we're thinking about strength, we need high load, low repetitions. There's even a dose response uh, that we can apply to that. And in terms of rate of force development, it's slightly different. We need a slightly different approach to optimize the adaptation of speed and muscle force production. And that parameter is important for everybody. So not just athletes, for all the populations and individuals getting back to, you know, being able to avoid falling off the curb when, when they're walking. So on that last um, sentence, I'd, I'd like to finish up, hopefully within the hour, uh, and uh, I'm, invite uh, questions. So if anybody's got any questions, please feel free. Claire, that, uh, thank you. That's fantastic. I'm going to take 30 seconds and then open up the floor. I want everyone to know that one, that this recording, uh, that this uh, webinar has been recorded. You can re-access it whenever you want uh, through your account on key clinical skills. Two, we're going to send out an email to each of you at the uh, later on this week that'll have, um, that'll have Claire's link, Info Support, that'll have the link to her website so you can look at, uh, you, can, you can feel free to look at whatever else she is offering. And then three, we're gonna have a little poll question that is going to be asking people about one, where they live, two, uh, their interest in, uh, in attending a live course so that they can attempt to um, further improve their exercise knowledge base and their ability to apply that in clinic, whether or not you'd like to attend a live course with Claire. So I, yes, let's open up the, uh, let's open up the floor to questions. Claire, uh, on a personal note, 
specificity of energy systems is what we push so hard to all of our sports students across the country are doing the sports fellowship and trying to get that into orthopedic practice is difficult and uh three sets of ten is a mantra that is out there and uh it is fantastic that you have addressed that uh so specifically open the floor. I'll also read out. So I, I do have a question uh, here uh, from someone just before uh, we open up audio. If you want to ask Claire a question, go ahead and open up your audio. Here's a great one. What do you feel, not what do you feel, how do you feel about blood flow restriction training? And that's a real, that's, that's, a, that's probably one of the, uh, one of the, one of the highlights out there right now that everybody yeah. thinks is the cool thing. BFR, BFR. Actually, mm. I love it. So I, I um, I'm a great fan of adjuncts to to rehabilitation when used at the right time with the right patient in the right way. So blood flow restriction training, um, really useful with potentially load compromised populations. Um, uh, it's not, you know, as with all of these things. Um, it will not be as effective of uh, as you know traditional resistance training. But if you can't do tradi traditional resistance training for whatever reason, then it, it presents a real opportunity to enhance muscular strength, cross-sectional area, um, and provide that platform to then go into resistance training proper. So um, I've got a lot to say on that. I've, I've done a, a whole masterclass on it and taught, taught that. But um, my, my feeling is it's, it's a really, really uh, useful adjunct and can be with a multitude of populations. Just might need to be a little bit careful about, you know, kind of how we're applying it and to whom. But, um, you know, you can use it with um, uh, isometric work. You can use it with dynamic work. Um, use it with whole body vibration. Lots of different, you know, electrical stimulation. Yeah, it's it's um, trying to fit one of those strategies where you can fill that that almost that dead space where you're unable to to make those those strength gains or attenuate losses. All right, I have a couple of more questions I can read out, but I'm going to open up the floor to anybody who wants to ask some, and then I'll fill in with some questions that people are uh, using on the chat. Go ahead, anyone. Okay, I'm going to read one. Um, does uh, looking at the five rep max uh, or, or using a uh, high load for, uh, for a low number of repetitions, uh, question about does the research uh, show optimization in terms of the number of days per week that you want to work on this? Now, here's the golden nugget, isn't it? How much, how often, what's the dose response? So I'll say it once. <laughs> Between 25 to 45 repetitions per muscle group per week at that five repetitions maximum intensity. So this is um, representative of my surveying of my view, the quality literature. Um, and the range is wide because, you know, we don't have a tremendous amount of well-conducted research um, in all populations and when you go to that elite level it's even less so it's probably over 45 um, repetitions per muscle group per week um, but then also um, kicking myself because I didn't publish this uh, just last year there's a systematic review meta-analysis which convert, confirmed the same so rather than time per week rather than sets rather than number of sessions, I prefer to distill it to repetitions per muscle group per week because that gives you a real easy metric to work with, to adapt, to change, to monitor, to apply, and also to, you know, um, titrate as well. If, it, if, if the responses are not as you expected, you've got some real objective parameters that you, you, can, you can change. Lovely. On, uh... On another set, people were asking, looking at the uh, number of repetitions uh, at a time, which ties in nicely. I mean, I know with elite athletes, we're looking at uh, four to six, sometimes even eight if they're highly trained, depending on how many days a week they're doing maximal strength training. Um, but uh, in terms of, uh, let's say with some untrained individuals, uh, what do you think you would start with in terms of the number of sets of uh, yeah. five rep max? Um, I honestly don't care. 
that's my on- is my answer because I just want them to come back for a second session. So if people have never done this stuff before, you know, I don't care what they do in the first session. I just want to see them feel a little bit more confident, a little bit more comfortable and start to elicit that behavior change. So if they don't come back, it's useless what I do in the first session. So um, it's uh, I want them to come back to a second session and a third session. So it goes alongside with these individuals that have never done this type of training before or indeed exercise at all. It's about behavior change. And being in an environment that, whether it be a gym, as in a lifting gym, or whether it be in a a physio clinic with some kit around, can be really intimidating. And, you know, I just want people to feel comfortable and I want them to come back because then gives you the window to make a change. If I tell you, you've got to do this, you've got to do this, you've got to do this, you're going to go, right, okay, I don't feel listened to, I don't feel heard, that's really threatening for me, I'll just not go back because I'm scared. You want to be supportive. So everybody's going to be slightly different in the way that you progress them. So when we've done the joint approach program, for example, um, we piloted this in a few ways. The first time was um, in person and we had people coming into a gym setting and it's pretty intimidating to be fair, but as in it had the AstroTurf down, it had the prowler curls, it, uh, sorry, prowlers, it had the um, lifting platforms as gym-like as you could get. But even those, indiv- and they had OA knees as well, pretty, pretty sore. It took about three sessions to get up to a five repetition maximum. Symptom limited, as in, you know, we changed the exercise in, in the way that we described and described in the webinar. Um, so I'd, you know, I, I want them to do as much as as much as they feel comfortable. So as I said, it might be three sessions, it might be five sessions to get up to that. So I wouldn't say there's a hard and fast rule how that individual is is. You get a sense. You get a sense of whether they're the receptive or you maybe mm-hmm. push them a little bit too much. That was great that you brought in that total knee joint replacement. We've done a little bit of research at Western looking at some maximal loading after post total knee joint replacement in terms of strength gains. And, uh, mm. you know, we just try to take into account the uh, the pain response so that we're uh-huh. trying to keep pain down and and still Absolutely. maximize load. And, and uh, we're, we're seeing good results in terms of function so the, the cross education effect is that. another another fantastic win there again we've just published a paper or say just a couple of years published a paper on that um that was in an acl population but it's got tremendous utility in in things like tkrs uh thrs even um unilateral injury where you strength train the opposite side and you can attenuate losses um so you might see typically I don't know, 10 weeks post ACL reconstruction, about 30% reduction in quadricep strength. You'd see that systematically reported across the literature. So in our control group, we, we saw that. In the group that did the, the five rep max, hamstring curl, leg press, and the extensions in the non-injured side, uh, immediately post surgery, we attenuated that to 16%. Um, so again, it's another another way where you fill in that dead space where you, you can't really get in like you were just saying that they're loading the symptoms. Uh, there's, a, there's a few articles on my site about that as well if people are interested in the cross-education effect. All right. Anyone else have a question that they would like to ask? I have a few more coming through in the chat, but I'm just going to give it 10 seconds here, see if anybody wants to ask. Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> Um, I put this one in the chat, but I'll be happy to ask it <laughs> for <Hi. me> too. <laughs> Hello. Is there um, a minimum rest time between sets that's kind of required? Great question. Fantastic question. So um, I'm glad you asked that because I negated to, uh, to elucidate on that, didn't I? If you look at um, some of the papers that attempt to summarize this data, uh, and particularly there's a couple in, in older adults, it can get quite ridiculous um, because uh, we're pooling a lot of data that do different things. So it might be that you see stuff that says that older adults might only need 60 seconds, but early athletes might need five minutes um, between sets when you're doing the same thing. And my, my view is um, 
at least a minute and a half between sets. So we want that recovery so you can have the same effectiveness going into the second set, the third set, the fourth set, rather than um, going too quickly. You're still fatigued and you've got diminishing returns for each set that you do thereafter. So you probably want about minute and a half to two minutes is 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 perfect if you can get a little bit more fine but for the levelness of people you're likely to be rehabilitating then and not to say that you're not rehabilitating the athletes the level as levelness at which they're working you're probably fine with that and, and within that rest period you can you know work the other side you can do another muscle group um, so to cut down their kind of time in, in the gym, if you like. So supersetting something different is, I find, uh, uh, really useful as well. Um, and the bit on the older adults thing, I think that's confounded by the fact that, um, and again, it's slightly older research, but we start to lose fast twitch motor units and, and muscle fibers as we, you know, the sarcopenic process, which those are the ones that are stronger, more powerful fatiguing more quickly so i think it's an artifact of of losing that rather than actually that's what we need but we're trying to build it so we're compromising the intervention so my, my, yeah a long-winded answer <laughs> to a, a short question so a minute and a half to two minutes i think you're pretty good um but just be aware that you might see stuff at either side of that but but just be mindful of the context and thank you for coming on live <laughs> Any Thanks, other Larry. questions? Great. Oh, somebody else. Hiya. Hi. Um, nice to meet you. Uh, I have a question about like if you if you load a muscle for strength, say not against resistance, but just maximal muscle contraction. Say you're loading your biceps into full flexion as hard as you can. Would that so people of certain populations can't go against the force? Would that add to strength gains at all, or would that affect in your Mm -hmm. what do you think i get what you're saying yeah so it would might do something but i'd say you could do if you think about what you're doing kind of flexing in, into a you know really uh, if you're doing that example there you're a very very short muscle length so we know that training at very short muscle lengths even with resistance is not as effective in terms of eliciting strength gains cross-sectional area gains as training at longer muscle lengths so what, and also you haven't got actually any, any resistance here um, that you're pushing against. You just kind of, it, it's not as, you're not going to generate the same overload as you would do sure. if, even sure. if you had something there, if you, even if you, you know, kind of had some sort of configuration where you, you're kind of pulling on something or you, I don't know, stand inside a door frame or something, then that would generate a greater overload and have a better effect on muscle strength development. So I'd say, Choose a, a better, uh, a more extended joint position. And if you can find something just logistically, it's a, it's a, it's a puzzle, isn't it, really, if you're in the home, uh, just to try and something to push, pull against that's not going to move. Thanks, that helps. Yeah, cool. Uh, but but any, any is better than none. Um, and then we kind of work back from or forward from that, I guess. Had a good question around uh, resistance training and osteoporosis. Obviously, load is super important for trying to slow down how fast your bone density is going to uh, it's going to mm -hmm. diminish. But you know, asking about some considerations for maximal load in that population. Yeah, um, I'm just going to defer here to my um, I call that Belinda Beck. Professor Belinda Beck, uh, the Liftmore trial, she says it far better than, than I could. Um, so she, if you look up L-I-F-T-M-O-R, that's the name of the trial. She's done it in men, females, uh, um, osteopenic, osteoprotic, uh, absolutely fabulous, completely sensible approach. So, you know, clearly swimming is not going to work, is it? Because you need to cause, you know, this stimulus adaptation. So if we want the the, the bones to um, adapt, become you know stronger, uh, improve bone mineral density, we need to apply the stimulus. So 
But there's then the hesitancy, oh, but they're frail. We can't load them, they'll break. But how are we going to introduce that stimulus? So she's done an amazing uh, series of, of programs now. There are CTs. There's actually some clips on YouTube that I think I've probably racked up the most views on. I show them in my course all the time because what you see is individuals, um, so post-menopause, um, osteoporotic women, deadlifting, the military press, squats and um pull-ups or um, resisted pull down um at 85 percent of their body mass at uh, one rep max and they've built up to that over time over you know they've learned how to do the lifts they've it's supervised but um one being able to see them do that just really is um does challenge those individuals. So you can't do that because you're old or you're osteoporotic. You've just seen them do it. But also if you look at the data, the RCTs, yeah, the data of these RCTs, the bone mineral density improved, reduction in number of falls, reduction in consequence of falls, improvement actually of curvature of spine with this as well. So it's, as I said, go and, go and read her research. Um, I'll connect with her on Twitter as well. She's on, on Twitter too. She's, uh, she's done a few sessions for me um, as well. She's really approachable. And that's that's the authority for me in, in, in uh, osteoporosis and, and lifting. Good. Anyone else? No such thing as a silly question. Okay, I've got one on the one on the chat here. So um, muscles that have atrophied secondary to joint range of motion limitations or OA uh, in terms of discussion in the literature about improving the health of tissue prior to mm -hmm. strength gains. Uh, Intra, yeah. So we look at the looking at asking about the uh, the yeah. rehab portion of that prior to increasing load. Sure. Good question as well. And again, hopefully it, it was um, assumed that I, I wouldn't necessarily advocate a massive five rep max program for individuals who have never trained before or indeed you've got some clinical concerns about, you know, people will, pro you know, a progressive approach is sensible. The rate at which people progress is determined by, you know, who they are, what they um, experiences psychologically what they're willing to take on but also uh, clinically what you you judge as important and important parameters so you know with these things you, you think you know if you take out the again com coming back to the building blocks what's the adaptation you need to make what's the stimulus you need to apply what's the person in front of you and how can you kind of formulate that equation answer that equation so if somebody has got atrophy they've got reduced um so if they're they've got away they're likely to be kind of sarcopenic as as well and you know if you're saying there's disuse associated with the inactivity and quality of tissues you're not going to get them doing i don't know um explosive type movements with accommodating heavy eccentric forces from the off you know you need to increase the strength of that tissue and the connective tissues as well um so a progressive approach will start to do that and you can might want to start with again depending on the experience isometric work might be a nice starter to get the kind of the familiarity with that going through to then dynamic um but over you know you'll get the the muscular adaptations or the cross-sectional area changes slightly later and the tenderness uh, changes, larger ten, uh, changes anyway, uh, slightly later than the, the neural changes, but you still need to make those changes to start with. So kind of a, a progressive approach seems sensible. Again, um, not one single answer uh, for, for all populations. Uh, what uh, The uh, osteoporosis, Christine Lindell, you said? The uh, osteoporosis researcher that you were referring people to? Me, sorry. Yeah, Belinda yes. Beck. Belinda oh, Beck. Oh, sorry. I, I was looking up something completely different. I'm just yeah. writing that in the chat. Belinda Beck, B E C K? Yeah. Got it. She's uh, at Griffiths in, um, in, in Australia. 
So she, uh, yeah, she, her lab and her her team have have made huge inroads in into this. Um, somebody says, despite the fact that they're an expert and a physiotherapist, could you please just tell my parents because they don't listen to me. <laughs> same, same. No matter what it is, you just can't. You can't tell your family anything, can you? No, no. But <laughs> it's like. Give me a script and I'll, I'll, I'll say it, whatever you want me to tell them. <laughs> so true. So true. Uh, your par- your par- family always wants free advice, but, uh, but, but then free advice is never, is never as, uh, as robustly entertained as paying for advice from someone else. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. What do you know? <laughs> All right, it's just about 8.30. Just going to open up the floor to anything else here. We've uh, got some people starting to drop out now, so understood. But uh, last chance for questions. Again, we promise to send out some information about Claire's uh, website, uh, et cetera, to you after the fact. I have a question. Great. Hi. Uh, thanks. thanks for the excellent uh, presentation. Really enjoyed it. Um, I'm not sure if I'm off base here, but... Um, do you incorporate um, talking to your clients about um, their diet? I'm talking specifically about like maybe boluses of uh, protein. I work with a lot of older adults and malnutrition is yeah. an issue. So mm. I, I find that those two go a lot together. But I, I don't know if you integrate that to your practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yes is the answer, but... Um, I'm also mindful of trying to change too many things all at once. So I wouldn't entertain that in, in the first few sessions at all. So, so I want, you know, we've got several behaviors that we need to change. And I'm really fortunate in that uh, I work with a psychologist as well. Um, so these, these strategies are, uh, are carefully considered. So if you, I'm not saying that you'd ever do this, but you can you know, imagine the effects of, okay, you need to resistance train, you need to change your diet, you need to stop smoking you also need to go out for a walk every afternoon and be like whoa just it's just not going to get done we know that will not get done so once they start to engage in the critical thing you want them to engage in and they're feeling comfortable with that then you can have those conversations and you're so right you're so so right you know again there's there's loads of stuff i've done on um and nutrition in in rehabilitation it's you know you need to fuel that tissue adaptation whether it's an older person or not are we take are we are we considering that and obviously protein is is one um one such thing so we know all the adults need greater boluses of, of protein to stimulate muscle protein synthesis by comparison to to younger adults but even just possibly even energy requirements are you you know are they meeting and um, what they, they need to meet in terms of just getting enough calories in to start with um, and obviously different people they have got different challenges but the, that's also associated isn't it, with, with older age uh, energy deficits so yes is the answer um, but where would be dependent on how receptive they are to, to changing things and, and, and making it stick thank you no problem All right, coming up on 8.30. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us tonight. And again, we'll send out some information uh, regarding uh, how to access Claire's uh, educational opportunities. And we'll follow up on that live course. And Claire, uh, you have a you have a link on your website for people to contact you. They can contact Absolutely. you with uh, sure, sure. questions. Yeah, it's on the first slide as well. Um, feel free to reach out on Twitter and get back to sport on Instagram. Info at getbacktosport.com is my email address, actually. So I'll pick that up. Um, but yeah, uh, happy to, to share that out. And uh, yeah, there's, there's stuff on my website too. So yeah, please do feel free to reach out. It's been, it's been lovely um, actually speaking to some people as well today, which is nice. <laughs> And everyone, this is available free on our website. It'll be recorded. It'll be up next week. And uh, anyone who wishes that they'd signed up but wasn't able to, tell them they can access this. Happy to have the more the merrier. (laughs) All right, everybody. Good night. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, everybody.